Amen. So here we are in Joshua chapter 21. So we've been using the last few chapters in Joshua as the Bible talks about the land allotments to the tribes of um, the children of Israel to talk about the details of the different tribes. I'm not necessarily going to go through verse by verse in Joshua chapter 21. I'm going to kind of give you an overview of what um, the chapter is talking about. And then we're going to look specifically at this tribe this evening, the Levites. There's a lot of parallels and a lot of pictures that the Levites um, provide for us as Christians today. And we're going to look into some of those details this evening. Look down at Joshua chapter 21 and look at verse number 1. So here in Joshua chapter 21, we're continuing... Um, in the story here. So, of course, last week we talked about the cities of refuge, which ties into Joshua chapter 21. You say, how? Well, let's look down at verse number 1. The Bible says, Then there came the heads of the fathers of the Levites, unto Eleazar the priest, and unto Joshua the son of Nun, unto the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. They spake unto them at Shiloh in the land of Canaan, saying, The Lord commanded by the hand of Moses to give us cities to dwell in, with the suburbs thereof for our cattle. So here um, we're seeing a difference already in the tribe of Levi. They don't get a territory. Remember um, the, the previous chapters we went through um, the territories of all the other tribes. Um, the, the, it was describing, it wasn't describing cities. I mean, it would mention cities, but the main portions of the chapter were talking about literal borders of land. So it was, it was big allotments of land for the other tribes of Israel. And here we see that the Levites only get cities. So they're asking, they're saying, where are our cities at this point? Now, we talked about the cities of refuge last week. So if you go to verse number 41 of uh, Joshua chapter 21, we kind of see um, the conclusion of the matter, but basically the entire chapter goes through each tribe of Israel, and it names the different cities in that tribe that the Levites will have. So in every single tribe, there is several cities that the Levites will have. So they'll have the city, and then they'll have the outskirts of those cities. So they do have some land. It's just that they don't have these massive chunks of land that is like a, a nation in itself. They have these cities in the, board, in the suburbs around the cities for their land. So the Levites do have some um, property for cattle, but that's not um, their main inheritance. And we'll look at that um, towards the end of the sermon. So every single tribe is stepped through in this chapter. It says these 13 cities, these four cities in these different tribes. So literally the Levites are scattered throughout the entire nation of Israel. Look at verse 41 for a conclusion of the matter. And so it goes through all the tribes and it ex explains all the cities. And then in verse 41, it kind of gives a conclusion. It says, All the cities of the Levites with the possession of the children of Israel were 40 and 8 cities with their suburbs. So basically, we had 48 cities in the 12 tribes of Israel that belonged to the Levites. And they were scattered throughout all the different tribes. And then you'll also see in this chapter what we talked about last week, which is six specific cities of the 48 that were refuge cities. So um, we talked about the cities of refuge last week, but let's look at the Levites this evening. Why are they different? Why, um, why the cities instead of a, a, an allotment of land? Let's go back to where we've been starting with every other tribe. Go back to Genesis chapter 49. Go to Genesis chapter 49. So we see that we see 48 cities and six of those are cities of refuge. But let's go back to Jacob's prophecy about Levi. And we'll see if we can find um, the beginning of, you know, the beginning of what happened here. Jacob's prophecy, of course, um, he gives to all his 12 sons. And then we've been taking that forward and seeing how that is fulfilled. Of course, Genesis chapter 49, um, Levi's prophecy is tied in in verse number 5 with Simeon's prophecy. We've already kind of talked about the story with Simeon. I'll, I'll refresh you for just a minute. But the Bible says in Genesis 49 verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. And I will divide them in Jacob, 
and scatter them in Israel. So a few different things here. Obviously, this is talking about, go back to Genesis 34, but let me just point out a couple of things that I purposely left out in the story of Simeon. Notice how Jacob points out their anger. He says their anger, you know, in their anger they slew a man. In the, you know, they slew much more than a man. I mean, we know from the story. But in their anger, but then look what he says. He says in their anger and in their self-will. So it says their anger was dri driven. He says, cursed be their anger. He says in the next verse. He says, you know, their anger, he's like, their anger was sinful. Their anger was cursed. He's, I'm cursing what they did. Because it was anger driven from what? From their self-will, what they wanted to do. Okay, and we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. He said, for it was fierce and their wrath, it was cruel. I'll divide them and I'll scatter them, he says, in Israel. So, um, he's cursing them here. I mean, if you're Levi and you're hearing this, you're like, my father is cursing me right now. You know, you're not looking at this, you know, scat you're going to be scattered. You're not going to, you know, your people are going to be scattered. No one wants to hear that. No one wants to hear, you know, brother so-and-so, let me prophesy, you know, how your future generations are going to be. Your people are going to be scattered all over. Nobody wants to hear that. Everybody wants to hear that their generations after them will be unified and together. I mean, think about what you want for your families. Raise your hand if you want all your kids just to be scattered all over the world, you know, after they leave your home. Nobody wants that. People want unity, and people want um, people to be together, not scattered. scattered. So Levi is certainly sitting here thinking, I'm being cursed. This is, I'm being punished. And, you know, I mean, Jacob is, is it, it seems like he's angry here when he's saying this. Okay, go back to Genesis 34 and look at verse 25. This is what they did. Of course, we remember this from just a few weeks ago. But the Bible says, and it came to pass on the third day. So these guys, they tricked um, Seshem, and they tricked this city, and they had them all circumcised. And they said, oh, we'll give our daughters to you to marry, and you can marry our daughters, but you have to be circumcised. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly, and slew all the males. And they slew Hamor and Seshem his son with the edge of the sword, and took Dinah out of Seshem's house and went out. So, you know, just another example that she was there willingly. She was there still again. Um, and the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. And they took their sheep. I mean, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. They took their sheep, their ox, and their asses, that which was in the city and that which was in the field, and all their wealth and their little ones, they took their kids and their wives, they took captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. Like, this was cruel, what they did. This was cruel anger, ridiculously cruel, actually. When you actually think about, you know, the, you know what actually physically happened here, and it all stemmed from what Jacob says. It all stemmed from the anger over what had happened to their sister. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. So, Levi, along with Simeon, and we, we're not going to talk about Simeon, but Levi here is being cursed by Jacob for his anger and his part in this angry, cruel thing that they did. So the question is, and we didn't look at this the last time we went through this story, but the question is this, is anger bad altogether? Is anger just bad? Is that what it is? Look at Ephesians chapter 4. I mean, think about this. Just think about it for a second. You know, think about the last time you were angry. Just start mixing that around in your head. Some of you look angry right now. So, you know, just think about when is the last time you were angry. But Ephesians chapter 4 is actually talking about our context. The context of Ephesians 4 is our relationships with each other. Our relationships with our brothers and sisters. And look at verse number 25. The Bible says, Wherefore put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. That's pretty good advice. Don't lie to each other. Hey, let's be truthful to each other. That sounds like a good um, you know, basis for relationships right there. Just be truthful. And then look at verse 26. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now let's read that again. You know, the Bible says here, it says, Be ye angry. You know, I mean, you, you heard what that says? I mean, wouldn't you expect it to say, like, be not angry? You know, when you're reading the Bible, I mean, many times when I read the Bible, the first few times I read this, I'm just like, I would go back all the time and I'd be like, shouldn't it say, be not angry? You know? But look, it says, be ye angry and sin not. 
and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So notice how it doesn't say don't ever get angry. It just says be when you're angry. It's saying when you're angry, sin not, is what it's saying. It's showing us here in this one simple phrase, in this one simple verse, that there can be an anger that is not sinful. So let's explore anger for just a couple of minutes. Turn to John chapter 2. Now, when I, when I asked you that question, when's the last time you got angry? Was it difficult to think uh, of the last time you got angry? Probably not, right? I mean, you know, if you're normal and you're a human being, you know, you probably get angry, I don't know, hopefully not every five minutes, but, you know, you get angry sometimes. Let's just be real. Look at John chapter 2. Look at John chapter 2. So let's break it down. Let's break it down. Let's look at anger for just a few minutes, and then we'll get back to the Levites. But this is worth looking at. Look at John chapter 2 and verse number 13. The Bible says this, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had, look at verse 15, And when he had made a scourge of small cords, that's a whip, okay? He made a, a whip or a, a weapon, of small cords of, of uh, you know, leather. He drave them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the table. So, I mean, this took some time. He drove them, he drove them all out of the temple. He drove all the cattle out, all the animals out, and flipped over all the tables and, and poured out all the money that was there. So here you had people in the temple, and they were selling. Look, I've actually seen this before. I've actually seen this. When I was on a, on a trip to Armenia, I was on a business trip many, many years ago, and the, the guys, they took me on a, well, on a day off, they took me up to these churches in the mountains, like these churches like completely carved out of the mountains. It was like the craziest thing I've ever seen. And it was, it was out in the middle of nowhere in this just church carved out of this granite mountain. And of course, it was, this, it was, a, it was a sight to see. So there was, there was you know, tourism there. And of course, there was people. There was people literally selling doves there. And, and I was like, "Why are they selling these birds?" And the guys told me, "Well, if you go and you stand on this rock and you let one of the birds go, you you know go to heaven or something. I don't know what it was, but it was something that you know it was a religious thing. They were turning it into merchandise. Okay, so I mean, they had turned God's actual temple in Jerusalem into a place to sell things. Of course, you know, you use doves, and you use these types of things. It's like, hey, there's, there's money to be made here, and they, that's what they were doing. And then look at verse 16. And Jesus, and Jesus said, And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Quoting Psalm chapter 69 right there. So Jesus, Jesus, I mean, clearly is angry here. That's the point. I mean, the point is he literally, he sat down, turn to 1 John chapter 3, he literally sat down, he took time to make a weapon, and then he uses that weapon to drive all the people and all the animals and all the cattle out of, out of the house. Now, look at 1 John chapter 3. So Jesus got angry. Jesus got angry. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4. And of course, we know that Jesus is without sin. But let's look at it in the Bible. Look at what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So if you ever want to explain what sin is to anybody, that's the, that's the verse right there. You know, what is sin? People don't know. Well, it's when you break God's law. It's the transgression of the law. It's the definition of the word sin. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So Jesus was without sin. He was man like us, he was flesh like us, but because he was also God, he went through his entire life without sinning one time. So if Jesus got angry, he clearly, it clearly proves that if Jesus being angry in John chapter 2 and 1 John chapter 3 are both true, that there is an anger that is without sin. Amen. Okay, now turn to Psalm chapter 7. And look, we don't have to make that logical connection because the Bible just straight up tells us that God gets angry. Okay, look at Psalm chapter 7 and verse number 11. Psalm chapter 7 and verse number 11. Look what the Bible says. Psalm, right in the middle of your Bible, the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 7, look at verse number 11. God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry 
with the wicked like once. No, it says every day. God is angry with the wicked every day. So look, the point being is that God's perfect nature gets angry. God's perfect nature gets angry every single day. So we know that there is an anger that is without sin. Now, just think about this for a minute, pragmatically. You've been thinking about the last time that you got angry. Think about, think about the kind of person, you know, what kind of person are you? Or what kind of person would you be if you just never got angry? If you never had any anger towards anything ever at all in your life. Think about that. What kind, I mean, what kind of person would you be? Think, what kind of father would you be? What kind of father would you be if you never got angry at anything? Like somebody was hurting your children and you're just like, yeah, it's, it's all good. You know, I mean, I mean, it's crazy to even think about something like that. What kind of mother would you be if you just never got angry? You know, what kind of, you know, I mean, just what kind of person in general would you be if you never got angry at anything? You would literally be a terrible human being Amen. if you never got angry at anything. And look, you would be completely worthless to those around you. Just lack of anger, that one thing. You would have, you would basically have no principles. You'd have no backbone at all. You would just, I mean, just whatever. Yeah, have you ever met people like this? I have. I've met people like this. They're just like, whatever about anything. Like their whole life, everybody, I mean, they're just like, whatever. You know, maybe, I mean, I don't know, maybe they're potheads or something. But I mean, people, some people just don't seem to care about anything. You know, and you, you just, I mean, I'm sure even those people would still get angry. But just imagine a person that never got angry. It doesn't, I don't think that it even exists. But it, you'd be a terrible human being if that's the case. That's how stupid, by the way. That's how stupid this whole philosophy is today. Because you can apply everything that I'm saying about anger, it works also about hate. It's exact, I mean, they're basically the same philosophy in the Bible. I mean, but the Bible does say in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it's like, there's a time to love and a time to hate. So, it's the same exact philosophy with anger. If you don't hate or get angry at anyone, I mean... I mean, that's this woke mob today. That's what they're preaching. They're preaching, oh, you should never hate, and you should never be angry, and all this, yet they literally want to kill and harass and, you know, and, and just completely destroy people that don't exactly agree with everything that they say. They're the most angry people you'll ever meet. I mean, they hate, harass, and assault anybody that doesn't agree with their stupid philosophy. It's crazy. It's crazy. So you must, I mean, anger, hate, look, there's a place for them according to the Bible. I mean, Americans, especially Christian Americans, need to grow a backbone and start realizing this today. Quit listening to this garbage that is out there today saying, oh, don't ever get angry. Don't ever hate anyone, as these people hate everybody that doesn't agree with them. So there is a righteous anger. All that to say that. There is a righteous anger. The, the problem is this. So here's the other side of the coin. There's a righteous anger. God gets angry every day. And look, God, God doesn't get angry with, like, God doesn't get angry with wicked things that happen. That's not what the Bible says in Psalm chapter 7. It said, it doesn't say God gets angry with the wicked acts. Or God gets angry with the wickedness. It says God gets angry with the wicked. He's talking about the people. God gets angry with people, just like God hates certain people. Amen. So, there is a righteous anger in the Bible. The problem is this, though. The problem is this. And now let's, let's get back to ourselves and think about the last time you got angry. Think about the last five times you got angry. Here's the problem. People justify their anger as righteous anger all the time. That's what people will end up doing. When most of the time... When us, as people, when we do get angry, or a lot of the time, or I guess it depends on the person, we're just kind of in the flesh. Kind of like Levi was. He was being, he, he was doing what? He was serving, he was serving himself with his anger. So this is what you have to ask. I mean, you just, I mean, this is just plain somebody that just loses their temper. 
They don't like what somebody did to them, and they just lose their temper, and they just explode. And they become angry. They're just in the flesh, is, is all that is. So, think about that last time that you got angry. Was it, let me, now let me ask you this. You, you've all got that, that, that moment in your life where you got angry the last time, you know, last year, whenever it was. Was it in defense of God? Was it in defense of morality? Was it in defense of the Word of God when you got angry? Is that why you got angry? Or was it because somebody didn't see things your way? You know, this is what we always have to be asking ourselves because we can certainly take this, oh, there's a righteous anger, I'm righteously angry, and you can just apply that to every single thing you get angry about. And then guess what? You're just going to be an angry jerk is what you're going to be. You're going to be an angry, negative person. This is what Ephesians chapter 4 is talking about. It's talking about, number one, it's saying, it's saying hey, when you get angry, don't sin. No. And, it's, and it says, get over it quickly. Get over it quickly. So you don't sin. Implying, implying that if you let anger, if you let anger, really any kind of anger, linger with you, that there's danger of, it, of you, you sinning from it. Doesn't that make sense? How many times have you been in an argument where you felt like you were right at the beginning and you got so angry and then, you know, maybe you said some different things and all this and you're like, oh man, now i got to apologize for all this stuff. <laughs> you know? Because, look, you didn't get over your anger quickly and it caused you to go into sin. Okay? That's why it says in the very next verse, neither give place to the devil. So you sit there and you just let yourself, okay, I've got a righteous anger here, or maybe it's not a righteous anger. Either way, get it done quickly, or it's going to stew and it's going to boil and it's going to lead you into sin. That's what the Bible is saying in Ephesians chapter 4. Don't give place to the devil. Get it done, get it over. Because you'll say, look, you will say and do stupid things, especially in unrighteous anger situations in your life. And it will just bring more sin upon yourself. So this is a brilliant piece of advice in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 25, 26, and 27. So that's really the question. You know, what is the anger in defense of? Is it in defense of God, in defense of his word, in defense of morality, or is it in defense of myself? There's your, there's your question on whether it's righteous or not righteous in the Bible. Is it de are you defending your pride? That's not righteous anger. So People, unfortunately, I think, get pretty good at making, making unrighteous anger. They kind of twist it and turn it into righteous anger in their own eyes. But then you end up with an angry person that sins all the time. That's how you end up with that type of person. So, there's a righteous anger, but keep it in its place. Let's go back to the Levites. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 23. 1 Chronicles chapter 23. So, what about the priests? What about the priests? So, they're scattered, but they're also... The priests. Now you know who else was a Levite. Let's look at First Chronicles chapter twenty-three. Look down at verse number fourteen. Look down at verse number fourteen of First Chronicles chapter twenty-three. So yes, they're scattered. But what about the Levites and what about the Levitical priesthood? How did that come about? Look at First Chronicles chapter twenty-three. Look who was a Levite. Look at First Chronicles twenty-three and verse number fourteen. Now concerning Moses, the man of God, his sons were named of the tribe of Levi. Moses and his older brother Aaron were Levites. They were of the tribe of Levi. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18 and look at verse number 1. And we start to see the story come together on how the priests became, or how the Levites became the priests. Look at Deuteronomy 18 and verse number 1. The priests... The Levites and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance in Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire in his inheritance. Therefore, they shall have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance, as he hath said unto them. And this shall be the priests due from the people. From them that offer a sacrifice, whether it be oxen or sheep, they shall give unto the priests the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maw. The first fruit also of thy corn and thy wine and thy oil and the first of the fleece of the sheep thou shalt give them. For the Lord thy God hath chosen him out of all thy tribes to stand to minister in the name of the Lord him and his sons forever. So the Lord God chose 
the Levitical tribe, specifically Aaron and his family, to be the Lord's priests. Go to Numbers chapter 3. Numbers chapter 3. Now there's a lot of, you can read a lot of different things on why people think um, God chose um, the Levites. But I think that the best way to look at it and the best way to think of why God chose the Levites, well, I think that they were, they were loyal, first of all. They were loyal to the Lord. And, of course, Moses and Aaron and were kind of the first leaders that the Lord took had to take his people. So it's pretty simple to see it that way. But you can see after they were chosen how loyal they remained to the Lord. Look at Numbers chapter 3 for one example. Look at Numbers chapter 3 for one example. Look at uh, verse number 1. These also are the generations of Aaron and Moses in the day that the Lord spake with Moses in Mount Sinai. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab the firstborn, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, Aaron, the priests which were anointed, whom he consecrated to minister in the priest's office. And Nadab and Abihu, these are Aaron's sons, died before the Lord when they offered strange fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. And they had no children, and Eliezer and Ithamar ministered in the priest's office in the sight of Aaron, their father. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near, and present them before Aaron the priest, that they may minister unto him. And they shall keep his charge, and the charge of the whole congregation, before the tabernacle of the congregation, to do the service of the tabernacle. So we see this priesthood, of the tribe of Levi, they take care of the tabernacle, and they are the priests, and they shall keep all the instruments of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the charge of the children of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. And thou shalt give the Levites unto Aaron and to his sons, they are wholly given unto him out of the children of Israel. And thou shalt appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall wait on their priest's office, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. So the Bible here is saying that from now on, from, from this point, it is Aaron and his sons and these Levites that are going to be doing this service to the tabernacle. And it's interesting, in Numbers chapter 3, in verse number 1, here you had Aaron's own sons did something wrong. They didn't follow the proper, you know, procedures for offering to the Lord. And they decided, hey, we're going to, you know, I mean, people do this all the time. They're like, hey, I'm just going to do it my way. I know the Bible says to do it this way, but I'm just going to do it my way. Well, when it came to the priesthood, you know, the Lord just killed them. The Lord just killed them for not offering the way that they were supposed to offer, and offering in a strange manner, offering strange fire. And look, those were Aaron's own sons. And Aaron remained loyal, and they all remained loyal to the Lord. So look, they showed, the point is, they showed the willingness to execute judgment regardless of the person. Regardless of the person. And look, that's, that's what the Lord needs. That's what the Lord needs. Look at Exodus chapter 32. Go to Exodus chapter 32 and look at verse number 26. Exodus chapter 32 and look at verse number 26. I mean, hey, be loyal to a man. Be loyal to a man in your life as long as he's loyal to the Lord. That's, that's what you should do. But only as he's loyal to the Lord. Aaron's own sons and the stranger has no chance. That's basically what the Bible is saying. It's saying, Aaron's own sons, the priests better listen to the way I say things need to be done, including the sons of the first high priest, Aaron. Look at Exodus 32 and verse 26. Here's another example of just the Levites, or the Levites, you know, they're just their loyalty to the Lord. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp. This is after, you know, the golden calf, and after, you know, the people had betrayed the Lord and were worshiping idols. And Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? And he's saying this to everybody. Let him come unto me. And look what the Bible says. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. So it was the Levites that had the Lord's back, that were super loyal to the Lord. So they were chosen to be the priests. Now, how did the priesthood work? There was, there was priests, they took care of the tabernacle and all the instruments, and just the ton of work that it must have been to do all these sacrifices and constantly be doing everything that's basically listed in the book of Leviticus, but there was also a high priest, Aaron being the first. So Aaron was the high priest, 
Aaron was the high priest. He was the first high priest. And in Leviticus chapter 16, it explains what, you know, kind of the main, the day of atonement, um, you know, exercise that the high priest was supposed to do, which is once a year, he would actually go into um, a, a, a special um, chamber inside the tabernacle, which later became a special chamber inside the temple itself, and go in there and do a sacrifice for the sins of the entire nation once a year. It was very specific, and you can read through it in Leviticus chapter 16 on how he was supposed to do this. I mean, the Bible literally says if you don't do it right, or you don't do it, you know, if you try to like go in more than once, you can't just go in whenever you want. It's like, or you're going to die, the Bible says. But go to Exodus chapter 30 in verse number 10. Just go back a couple chapters. Exodus chapter 30, look at verse number 10. And the Bible says here, talking about Aaron, the first high priest. Talking about this day of atonement. And the Bible says, And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it through your generations. It is the most holy unto the Lord. So this was the job of the, the high priest. He was to be the one that would go in once a year and make this intercession for the people. The priesthood itself, there was lots of work and ministering that the priest did, and we'll get to that in a minute. But the high priest himself, this was his biggest responsibility, was to go in and make this, this, this atonement for the people once a year, year after year after year. And when Aaron died, there was another high priest and another high priest and another high priest. There was always a high priest up until Christ that was doing this. Now go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. God put an end to the high priest with Christ. So this was a picture of Christ, this high priest. Look at Matthew chapter 27, and look at verse number 50. There's a reason that when Jesus died on the cross, something very specific happened in the temple. So the temple was, of course, you know, the tabernacle was the tent, and there was this inner chamber. But the temple also had this inner chamber that was separated by a veil, and in Jesus, in, when Jesus died on the cross, in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 50, a very specific thing happened in the temple. I mean, there was darkness. There was all these things that took place at the crucifixion. There was darkness that came over the land. There was an earthquake. But something very specific happened. Look at verse 50. Matthew chapter 27, and look at verse number 50. The Bible says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. This is when Jesus physically died. And behold... The veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. So when Jesus died, this veil that separated the normal you know, chamber of the temple to the holy of holies, or this place where the, the ark was, it, it was torn. It was, it was torn from the top to the bottom. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 4. God... God put an end to the high priest when Jesus died on a cross. Look at he on the cross. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Look at verse 14. Because Jesus is now the new high priest. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse 14. All of these things that you read about in the tabernacle, in the temple, and throughout the Old Testament, all through the book of Leviticus, these are all pictures of what Christ was to represent. And Hebrews ties all that together. Look at verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Look what the Bible says. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So the Bible here is explaining, and it explains several other places in Hebrews, that Jesus is now our high priest. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17. So Jesus replaced the office of the high priest. And of course, Jesus had to make, what's the difference? Jesus doesn't have to go and make a sacrifice year after year. Jesus had to make a sacrifice one time. Because he is the high priest. He's the best sacrifice. And it doesn't need to be made by, you know, year after year after year. As a matter of fact, all of those sacrifices never took away sins. It was just a picture of the coming sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Amen. It was an example of what God was going to do. Now, let's look at the priesthood in general. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17. What was the job? So we see the job of the high priest. We see that Jesus replaced the high priest as Jesus was always 
the high priest. In the, all the priesthood and the high priest was it was just a picture of Christ. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17. But what about the priesthood? What about all the other Levites? Look at um, Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse number 8. What about all the other Levites that were priests? If there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment, between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, between being matters of controversy within thy gates, then thou shalt arise and get thee up into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and thou shalt come into come unto the priests, the Levites, and unto the judge that shall be in those days, and inquire, and they shall show thee the sentence of judgment. Deuteronomy chapter 33. So here the Bible is saying that the priests, you know, just the, the priests, the Levites that were priests, they were part of actually judging the people, about helping carry out justice in the nation. That was a job of the priesthood. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 33. Look at verse number 8. So that's a big job, talking about, you know, um, you know, just all kinds of matters. Imagine a, a massive nation with hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people. There's going to be a lot of conflict. There's going to need to be people that will be able to judge conflict and deal with all these situations and, and dish out justice, is what the Bible is saying. Look at Deuteronomy 33. Look at verse number 8. And of Levi he said, Let thy Thuman and thy Urim be with the Holy One, whom thou didst prove at Massa, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they had observed thy word and kept thy covenant. They, being the, the Levites, they shall teach Jacob thy judgments, and Israel thy law, and shall put incense before thee, and the whole burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. So we already know that the priests, they do the work of the tabernacle, all of these sacrifices that were done, there wasn't just the Day of Atonement sacrifice, they, they also were involved, not in just the work of the temple and all the sacrifices and everything that went with that, they were involved in judging the people, and then we see in Deuteronomy chapter 33, it was their responsibility to teach the law to the people. They were to teach, I mean it would make sense Right? It would make sense if you had a nation that you were going to judge out of the book of the law. That it would make sense to probably do a little bit of preliminary you know, teaching so you, maybe you wouldn't have so many trials that you have to deal with. You know, because people don't know what's right and what's wrong. So that was put upon the Levitical priesthood itself. Was they were to not only just judge, but they were also to be proactive in teaching the law to the nation. That's a big job. That's a big job to be out there and teaching the law to the nation. You say, well, man, that would have been terrible to be then. Well, i got bad news for you. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. So we see that there's a high priest. That high priest was just a picture. It was a picture of Jesus Christ. Look, guess who you're dealing with today? We're dealing with Jesus Christ directly today. That's who we as saved believers deal with. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. So what about, the, what about the priesthood? This is where the, the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer comes in, right here. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9. But the Bible says, but ye, meaning believers in Jesus, you, you all sitting here tonight, ye are a chosen generation, a what? A royal priesthood. And oil and and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look, the tribe of Levi and the priesthood of Levi, of the Levites, is a picture for us today. We are the priesthood today. You say, Jesus is the high priest. Who's the priesthood? Who are the priests? It's us. It's us. Christ is our high priest. I mean, we have access to the Father, just like the high priest would go in and in intercession, you know, um, into the holy place. We have access to the Father through Jesus Christ. Amen. But the priesthood itself is us. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 18. The Bible says about Jesus, I, I can just read it for you. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Look, there's a lot there in that, in that verse right there. Or there's the Trinity right there in that verse. 
You know, the Trinity, the Trinity is in a lot of verses in the Bible. You know, but look, there's a lot in that verse, but the point being is that we have access through our high priest, which is Jesus Christ. But back to the priesthood is us, which means that we have the same responsibility that the priesthood in the Old Testament had, which is what? What was the responsibility? Well, you know, we're not taking care of, of a temple, but, you know, the Bible says that our body is a temple. You know, we do have a church here that we take care of. But the, the bottom line is we, we are to teach the law to the people. Amen. We are to, you know, know what the Bible says, and we are to go out and we are to teach the law to the people. We are to preach, you know, as Jesus would say, what was Jesus preaching? The kingdom of heaven. Amen. We are to preach the kingdom of heaven to the people. That is our priesthood. We are to carry the gospel. And then when people come to church, we are to teach the law. Is what we're to do. So look, it's our pre it's our priesthood. It's our priesthood. The Levitical priesthood is just a picture of what we're supposed to do. So when you're reading about the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament, just be thinking, just be thinking, how does this apply to me? Because that's what you are. You're a priest today. So it's a perfect picture. It's a perfect picture of how you know God used something in the Old Testament to show you know, what our responsibilities are going to be today. Now, let me make one last comment about the, Le the Levites. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Now, I bet if you were Levi, so we see that the, the Levites are, are just a great picture of the believer today. You ever heard, if you ever hear the doctrine, the priesthood of the believer, exactly what I just preached to you. Okay? Now look, look at Deuteronomy chapter 10 and look at verse number 9. And I kind of read past this in a verse already, but I want to go back to this. But just imagine being Levi and having your dad Jacob say to you, you know, cursed be your anger. You are going to be scattered amongst Israel. You know, cursed be your self-serving, angry, cruelty. You know, and you're just like, you know, I mean, all the others, he's like, well, Reuben didn't get such a good one. But all the others, he's like, oh, you know, you're going to be... Uh, strong and a lion's wealth and you know all this and 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 you are like cursed be your anger and you're gonna be scattered everywhere and you're just kind of like you know but I just want to show you look at Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse number 9 look at Deuteronomy chapter 10 in verse number 9 look what the Bible says in verse number 9 of Deuteronomy 10 it says wherefore Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren so that sounds bad that sounds bad that that's kind of probably what what Levi heard when Jacob was giving the, the Genesis chapter 49, you know, curse upon him. But then look what the Bible says. The Lord is his inheritance, according as the Lord thy God promised him. So here we see, here we see with the, with the tribe of the Levites, we see something in Genesis chapter 49 that seems like this terrible curse. Yes, Levi did a terrible thing as an individual. Levi and Simeon, they did a terrible thing. It was horribly cruel. They murdered all these people. They kidnapped all these people. But look at what God did as this tribe became super loyal to the Lord. They became, I mean, Moses and Aaron came from this tribe that led the children of Israel literally into, you know, well, up to the promised land, and just, you know, advocated for the Lord, and advocated for the people, again and again and again. Aaron became the first high priest, and then his sons became the high priest, just serving the Lord, serving the Lord, serving the Lord. Look what the Bible does, look what the Bible does with this curse. He turns it into this, this wonderful blessing, because they didn't get land. They didn't get land, they didn't get borders. They didn't get these chunks. You know, we look at these, you know, we looked at the, the five uh, insignificant tribes. They got the little tiny pieces, and Dan had this little tiny piece, and they went and they raided this city and got, this, got some more land because they weren't strong enough to conquer the land they were supposed to in the first place. And, you know, you look at Judah. Well, they had a lot of land. You look at Ephraim. They did pretty well. They came out of it pretty well. But the Levites had nothing, but they got the Lord. Their curse became this huge blessing. So that's what the Lord can do with things that you may see, you may see as a curse at first. You may, you may see something in your life that's like, you know what, uh, I, I'm being punished for this, whatever. But look, God can turn that into anything that He wants. In any in ways that you can't even tell, you can't even see. Because I'm sure Levi didn't have anything positive that he was thinking that would come out of this. 
Yet this tribe, generations later, hundreds of years later, ended up being the ones that were the most loyal to him, that had the Lord's back. And they, he literally is like, yeah, you're not going to get any land. Instead, you're going to get me as your inheritance. They literally got the Lord as their inheritance. Think about that when you're serving the Lord in your life. Think about that inheritance in your life. I mean, you think about, I mean, I know it's hard not to think about things that you need in your life, you know, things that you have to, you have to purchase to live and things, and we all want to live comfortable lives. But look, the most important inheritance, look, this horrible curse became the best blessing out of all the tribes. And that can happen to you as well as you are a priest and you go out and you serve the Lord and you're loyal to the Lord and you have God's back and God will give you himself as an inheritance. These are your rewards in heaven. He will also, you know, he'll reward you here. You know, I mean, the Lord will be your inheritance. Just, I mean, you are the priests. This Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse number 9, it applies to you. That the Lord is your inheritance. It, I mean, but are you are you the are you a priest? Is what you need to ask yourself this evening. Are you serving the Lord? Are you loyal to the Lord? Are you are you are you teaching the law to your families? Are you teaching the law to people? Do you want to disciple people? Are you out preaching the gospel to people? That what that's your priesthood. And from that work, from that priesthood, your reward is God. That's what the Bible teaches us here, and that's what we can take away. Not from this. I mean, this great, what, what Levi thought for sure was a curse became the most blessed tribe in the whole nation of Israel. Let's bow our heads and have a word.